So, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Goblat. I'm a chief scientist in New Light Technologies in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to the first session of the last day. You made it. Um, we, um, this session uh, will have um, three talks. Um, all the talks are related to um, image analysis, image processing, and extraction of meaningful information from um, satellite imagery, whether with free satellite data or with free or open source um, um, environments. Uh, we will have three talks. Um, I will start um, with um, this talk on um, using free satellite data for city resilience. Then um, Jesco Zimmerman and Stuart Green from um, Ashton Research um, Center will talk about um, extraction of cloud-free images um, in an AI from um, a remote sensing archive. And um, at 10 o'clock, um, Andrea Aim from GeoSolutions will, um, and Jody Garnett from um, Location Tech will talk about um, the state of um, JAI. So I will start um, with this talk. Um, and I will show how free satellite data can be um, utilized um, for um, a stronger city resilience. This project was done together with the World Bank, uh, three divisions at the bank, um, the GFDRR, OpenDRI, and the um, City Resilience uh, Program. So as you all know, urbanization has been a fundamental trend of the past two centuries and the key force that shapes many dimensions in our world. In 2007, for the first time, more people lived in urban areas than in rural areas. And by 2050, more than two thirds of the population is expected to be um, um, urban, with the majority of the increase in um, Asia and um, Africa. Now, urbanization obviously has uh, many positive um, implications. Um, it helps grow economies. It um, enhances opportunities for education. Um, it can decrease some um, poverty. And in general, it improves living conditions. But on the other hand, it also creates immense challenges to um, environment and the society by increasing demand for public services, increasing demand for energy, putting pressure on public infrastructure, um, and increasing um, floods, um, urban floods. So just by looking um, in the past um, um, few um, um, centuries, we see um, an increase in the frequency and in the severity of natural disasters. For example, um, by looking at um, floods, we can see that more and more cities, especially in the developing world, are more and more exposed to um, urban flooding. And by 2030, 40% 40 um, um, of the global um, urban land will be in high frequency flood zones. In parallel, um, more and more structures and population are affected by um, these um, events. Um, and you can see a constant increase in the number of housing units that are damaged due to these um, events. This is just one example of the consequences of major um, flood events. Um, this um, event occurred um, earlier this year in May in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, with um, eight people being killed, hundreds of buildings destroyed, and property valued in billions was destroyed. And the image that you can see here in the top um, left, um, it went viral um, um, during um, this event with 300 chickens that um, were rescued during the, um, this flood event. So to address all these um, changes, um, the climate change um, and the challenges that um, we as a society face, um, in 2015, um, all United Nations members adopted 17 sustainable goals um, that call for a global partnership to address all these challenges. One of these goals is um, goal number 11, when we heard um, about this goal in a few um, previous sessions, uh, which talks specifically about building um, urban resilience. And one of the targets in this um, goal um, says that by 2030, um, we should reduce the number of deaths and the number of people affected by disasters, um, decrease the direct economic losses due to these disasters, and focus on the protecting and protecting the poor and the people in the in vulnerable situations in the cities. So in this talk, I want to focus on one dimension, um, on um, urban flooding. Um, and there are different methods um, to track um, floods in cities, uh, whether it's uh, by um, stream gauges, whether it's by crowdsourcing, there are um, different apps that can capture um, flood events and depth of floods um, and different flood monitoring systems. And this data, after it is collected, it is being disseminated um, through web applications, um, story maps, and uh, by other um, means to the citizens 
and to governments and cities um, to help them better prepare for uh, future uh, major flood events. On the other hand, um, there are more and more um, satellite data, including uh, free satellite data that is constant, constantly being collected uh, from every location on Earth. Currently, there are close to 2,000 um, satellites that um, constantly orbit Earth and collect data. Uh, more than 600 of them are designed specifically for Earth observation um, and science. And they collect data in various spectral, spatial, and temporal resolution. And again, some of the data, or many sources of the data are publicly available and free. Um, higher resolution will obviously be more expensive. Uh, for flood events, we usually use the optical imagery um, and the SAR data, which can penetrate the cloud coverage. And I will show how we used Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 together to map um, um, flood events in cities. Now, I think that there are four trends in the um, satellite um, industry. First, more and more countries provide um, open um, satellite data, which is made publicly available to researchers, um, academic, um, for governments, and for cities. Again, to better prepare and improve city resilience and planning, sustainable planning. In addition, there are more and more satellites um, that are being launched. Um, the satellites are becoming smaller, which means that they are less expensive. Um, which means that they are able to collect, we are able to launch more and more satellites that will collect data from every location on Earth in even higher resolution than previously. In addition, the price of the satellite data is decreasing, which allows um, um, more accessibility to these data sets. And as a result, more and more open satellite data are being downloaded and utilized by researchers, universities, um, and cities and governments. So these are the main four trends in the satellite um, industry. And all of this data that is being collected, and Lancet is only one satellite that is being collecting data since the 1970s, is archived. And it helps us understand how Earth is changing. Um, whether uh, changes in um, floods, flood vulnerability, water extent, expansion of um, urban areas um, and cities, um, deforestation processes, um, all these time lapses that you see were done in um, Google Earth um, Engine. And I will talk a little bit about it. In addition, these sources of satellite data, including the free satellite data, can be used for um, city resilience. For example, using this data, we can um, map built-up land cover in cities and see how cities expand and evolve. Uh, we can map um, green spaces and vegetation in cities and see how they are related to flood events, for example, and accessibility of the public uh, to open and green spaces in the city. Uh, we can also map bodies of water, uh, persistent water, or flood events. Um, forest cover and see how um, urbanization um, is related to um, deforestation, um, flooded areas during major flood events, um, economic activity using nighttime light data, and overlay all of this data with um, infrastructure data and roads to see how they are all related to the infrastructure in the cities and how, for example, flood events challenge the infrastructure of developing um, cities. Earlier this year, in um, June 2019, um, um, the World Bank, together with um, other organizations, um, organized the um, Madrid Resilience Planning Workshop um, with um, around um, 30 uh, participating cities, with the goal to help cities package, prioritize, and design resilience-enhancing um, investment. The data, um, one of the main tools um, that were used during this workshop is the city scan. Um, which is basically a package of geospatial information um, that was created mainly with publicly available um, data sets and with open source tools. All of these products were used to help cities better understand how they can prioritize investment in infrastructure. Some of the layers that um, were created in the city scans are population demographic trends, um, city competitive, competitiveness and economic growth, built form, um, local institutions and planning, and others. As you saw, there were many layers that were created in the city scan. Um, in this talk, I just 
really briefly want to discuss one of the dimensions that um, we analyzed in the city scan, which um, is um, urban flooding. And there were four main um, questions um, that we addressed. One is uh, which parts of the cities of these 30 or close to 40 cities um, experience frequent flooding? Uh, what is the relation between flood risk and um, urban economic activity? Um, how are floods related to green spaces and open spaces in the city? Um, and how um, urbanization, which results in deforestation, is also related to increased flood events. These were the main four um, challenges that we um, tried um, to answer or help the cities better understand. We only used um, free geospatial um, data sets. So for example, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Landsat, um, DMSP OLS, which collects nighttime light data, Virus, which also collects nighttime light data. We also used existing um, classification products, for example, the deforestation pro product of Matt Hansen for UND. The analysis was um, done in Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine is not open source, but it is um, publicly available and free for non-commercial um, use. It's a platform, a very good platform for um, geospatial analysis, remote sensing analysis, primarily at scale. Um, some of the layers that um, um, we analyzed is um, city vulnerability flooding, green open spaces, parks, gardens, deforestation, and hotspots of um, economic activity, at least according to the nighttime light data. We had a few requirements. The main requirement was um, to use only uh, free and publicly available um, imagery. Use robust and well-established methodologies to map these um, floodings. Make sure that this me these methods will be generalized and um, applicable to um, as many cities as possible. Um, provide the bank with um, the full package of the code. So all the codes that we developed, um, um, we delivered to the bank. Um, and the data and the, the analytical um, outputs were aggregated to a common special division or a fishnet, as I will show you um, in a minute. But in general, um, the idea was um, to create an openly and shareable package of tools and methodologies that could be adapted easily um, by the cities. Um, I don't want to delve into the, all the met method and the techniques. Um, just really briefly discussed how we did this project. So um, to detect the um, flood events, um, we did the analysis with um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, Sentinel-2 in a special resolution of up to 10 meters, also Sentinel-1. They both collect data from every location on Earth um, at, at uh, every um, five or a little bit more days. Um, first, we did a literature review um, where for each of the 30, 40 cities, um, we um, looked for um, any major flood events that occurred since 2015. And why 2015? Because Sentinel-2 is available from 2015. Um, so we did a literature review, um, um, identified all the major flood events, we created um, a baseline image of a non-flood state um, in each city, both based on Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, then, for each major flood event, um, we mapped the flood extent during this event. Um, Sentinel-1, we detected difference in the uh, backscatter um, signal. Um, it's a radar-based, generally speaking. Um, and with um, Sentinel-2, we detected um, differences in um, AWEI, or the Automatic um, Water um, um, Extraction Index. Um, then we created an aggregated um, flood vulnerability, as I will show you in a minute. Just to look at um, one um, flood, event in, flood event in Lima, Peru, you can see that um, this is um, how um, we can capture the flood event with um, Sentinel-2. You can see um, here um, the difference between the flood state and the non-flood state, which was detected as flood event. Also with um, Sentinel-1, we can see differences in the backscatter signal, which allows us to extract these flooded areas during this um, um, specific flood event. All of the flood events, uh, all the major flood events of all the cities were aggregated into a common fishnet, so each each cell here in the fishnet um, has the frequency of flood events over the last uh, four um, years. This allowed us to um, extract all these, um, all these clusters of areas that experienced major flood events during these um, last um, five years. Uh, we also uh, mapped um, open and um, green spaces. 
Um, again, using Sentinel-2, uh, we relied on the well-known NDVI index. Um, we uh, identified the threshold of all the pixels because, you know, and then the, the value range from minus one to one, and there's always a question, how do you extract, how do you create from it a binary map of green spaces? Uh, we created the threshold, so we calculated all the, um, we detected all the um, green spaces in each city. We aggregated all this data into this common fishnet and calculated for each cell the percentage of um, green space in the cell compared to built-up land cover as measured by the global human settlement layer. Um, or we also detected a um, hotspot of um, economic activity. We used um, two um, satellite data um, to measure nighttime light data. Uh, one is um, DMSP OLS, which is um, available since 1992 to 2013, and VIRS, which collects nighttime light data in higher spatial resolution um, and more frequently. You can see here just the um, difference between a pixel of um, DMSP OLS and a pixel of VIRS. And this difference, you can, it can also be visible here. So my point in this slide is that when you use VIRS, you are also able to detect in very high resolution hotspots of economic activity in the city, and which um, neighborhoods in the city are um, more or less developed um, or economically developed. Um, there are different methods to uh, measure, to use nighttime light nighttime lights to measure economic activity. One is sum of light, which is basically you aggregate the value of the pixels into a common spatial division. Um, and this value represents, in general, how much light is emitted in the unit of analysis. The other approach which we adopted here is a slope of change. We um, collect the data, the nighttime light data of each pixel in each location um, every, every month and we record the slope of change in the economic activity um, to see which areas increased more dramatically or less dramatically than others according to the slope of the change um, across time. So some of the things um, that um, um, we can um, understand from this data, and I don't have time to um, go into all the results. So for example, how um, expansion of urban areas are related to um, urban flood risk zones. And we found that in many, in many cases, it, it is well known, um, um, urban areas are developing along streams and channels and fl floodplains, which obviously um, cause an increased vulnerability to the cities. Um, how, um, how flood events are related to deforestation, and as expected, there are more floods in areas that um, have been deforested um, since um, 2000. How flood events are related to open spaces and green spaces. Um, you know, uh, um, it is known that um, green spaces are able to absorb more water and decrease the risk of floods. On the other hand, we did find in many cases um, um, static water, stable water in these open and green spaces. And also um, how flood events are related to economic activity. Um, it, we also found the increased flooding in economically developed areas. It's not that only um, um, less developed areas are flooded more frequently, the opposite. Um, areas that have been more developed, maybe more paved areas uh, um, or more structures, um, show uh, more uh, flood events and higher frequency. So to summarize, um, cities, especially in, the, in developing countries, are becoming increasingly vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters. Um, in order to help them maintain sustainable, um, they must rely on geospatial data to prioritize and design resilience-enhancing investments. Free satellite data, whether it's Sentinel, whether it's Lancet, even MODIS in some cases, nighttime light data, are becoming increasingly available and together with free um, cloud-based computational platforms such as Google Earth Engine and or others, it is now possible to analyze this data in close to real time and inform cities about how they can prioritize investment um, in infrastructure. In free satellite image resources are still underexploited. Um, um, and we need to continue developing the tools to extract meaningful information from these um, sources. In addition, I think that we need to improve the way we communicate this data. So currently, the city scans are a bunch of maps, PDF maps, that uh, um, were discussed during the workshop. I think that. In the, the future of this will be to create a, a story map, whether you know, 
preferably with uh, publicly available and open source solutions to communicate this data and also allow cities to perform basic analysis. So thank you very much and I'm open to questions.